All right. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Tim Leonardovich, and I am the Director of Nursing and Health Policy with the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario. And it's my uh, pleasure to welcome you this evening to the fourth in uh, the fourth and final in a series of RNAO-led webinars um, regarding um, the support of Syrian refugees. Uh, to Ontario. Uh, we have an excellent speaker and presentation lined up for you this evening, uh, but before uh, doing, uh, launching into our presentation, I want to take a moment just to explain how we've gotten here and some of the context um, behind it. So uh, RNAO is the professional association that represents RNs, NPs, and nursing students in Ontario. Uh, we know that it's directly connected with the ends or the strategic objectives of the association uh, that um, supporting uh, the health of refugees is an important priority for nurses and thus for RNAO. And um, some of the involvement that we've had with supporting refugees includes um, we received uh, intervener status at the Federal Court of Appeal um, regarding, um, at the time, the previous federal government had made cuts to the interim federal health program for refugees. And, of course, we saw the um, impact, the negative impact that would have on refugees and we very much um, got involved and we were very pleased to, with the Canadian Association of Health Centers, um, have the opportunity to, to get that intervener status at the Federal Court of Appeal. However, um, with the current federal government, they actually uh, overturned those cuts and in fact restored and uh, somewhat expanded the program so we never end up, ended up actually having to go to court for that but we were prepared to do so. And we've also been um, very much involved in other activities in response to the cuts and getting involved in uh, National Days of Action for Refugee Health um, and so on. Um, as well, um, and specifically in regards to supporting and welcoming Syrian uh, refugees. Uh, you may have seen within a registered nurse journal, we specifically had, uh, I think it was a feature story actually on supporting um, refugees as being very important because as registered nurses, nurse practitioners and nursing students, there will be opportunities where we do have um, refugees, they may be Syrian or, or of other descents who are our, our clients or our patients. Um, or we may just encounter them within our communities and want to make sure that we are as welcoming as we possibly uh, can be. And um, certainly, um, you know, the purpose of this webinar is I, I myself personally am not uh, an expert uh, in uh, supporting uh, refugees. I'm uh, an avid learner and I've collected a lot of really great wisdom, but that uh, strength really comes from the experts and the knowledge of members. And uh, we really see these webinars as an opportunity to bring members together to uh, learn from one another, uh, to share ideas, and, and RNAO really serving that uh, convener role. And so this is, as I mentioned before, the fourth in the series of webinars. Uh, we did have three very well done webinars to date that included representatives from primary care. We had a primary care RN, we had a nurse practitioner, we had a representative of the Canadian Armed Forces, and we also had a representative from the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, each of whom have added their unique contributions. And then uh, in between those presentations, we also had great dialogue and feedback from members because we really want this to be a member-driven uh, initiative. And so we maintain very close connections as well with the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care and ensuring that, uh, that uh, nurses are able to fully contribute to efforts to support uh, Syrian refugees and other refugees as well, of course. And that work remains ongoing. And I know that there are a number of you on the phone who are very much involved as well, whether it be within your professional capacities or maybe even within your communities in supporting um, refugees and refugee families. So um, just to help uh, give you a little bit of an orientation to the webinar platform, uh, hopefully you are on WebEx. Um, you will see that there is a question um, uh, area on WebEx that you can actually input your questions into, and we would be pleased to 
uh, answer them after the presentation. Feel free to put questions, comments, feedbacks, ideas, uh, whatever you would like. Um, and we also will open up the line um, after the presentation for those who want to ask their question over the phone. Um, I also want to extend my gratitude before we begin to Josephine Mo. Josephine organized uh, the webinar and has been um, a great help in communicating with you for registration uh, and marketing the events and figuring out all the logistics for uh, today. Um, so I'm going to now, uh, it's my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce my colleague uh, and the presenter for this evening, um, Shyla. Uh, Shaila, and uh, you're going to have to let me know if I, I get your last name right, uh, Aranha. Uh, I have Leonard Tovich as my last name, and so I know often it can be a mouthful, but I believe it. Shaila Aranha, who is a long-term care best practice coordinator for the Waterloo Wellington Lynn. She works with long-term care organizations to implement RNAO's best practice guidelines and evidence-based practices. She serves as faculty in project management at the RNAO Clinical Best Practice Guideline Institute, the Advanced Stream. She is an internationally educated registered nurse uh, since two, 19, and has been in Ontario since 1992. She graduated with her Master's of Science in Nursing from Deuville College in Buffalo in 2005, and she has advanced education and experience in project management. Her nursing experience extends over 20 years as a practitioner and educator and also in management. She has worked across health sectors in community care, public health, long-term care, adult day programs, and rehab. In addition, she's been leading multiple projects as a supervisor with interdisciplinary teams, offers consultation on quality improvement and risk management and BPG implementation and evidence-based practices. She's very passionate about collaborating on initiatives across health sectors and sharing knowledge to improve nursing and health care. And um, Shaila has been um, really, really enthusiastic and wonderful to work with in preparation for this webinar. I know in our professional um, capacities as colleagues at RNAO, Shaila really does have uh, a wealth of experience, and she is going to present uh, today uh, on linking um, uh, care strategies to RNAO's uh, best practice guidelines. So, Shyla, I'm going to turn things over to you. Welcome, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Tim, for that a very extensive introduction. And good evening, everyone. I'm very excited to be here and share with you from the front uh, as well as to plan for the future. So um, bear with me for the next little while, and then we, I am interested to hear from you because you are um, working with the Syrian refugees, and um, I've got to learn a lot from you as well. Uh, my presentation, I have um, attempted to um, portray three objectives. So here they are up on the screen. I will illustrate some of the approaches to care for the multi-generational family across health sectors to integrate the RNAO best practice guideline recommendations in supporting Syrian refugees, and lastly, to share evidence-based best practice resources, which are RNAO best practice guidelines or resources, as well as some others. So just taking us back to Ontario's Health Action Plan, uh, if you recall the uh, placemat, I've just taken a bit of a section here. So um, as we work along this uh, Health Action Plan, we have arrived at today's webinar, which is our fourth in the webinar series, as Tim just said. And I will um, address some of the items in phase four of this action plan as we continue to work with the refugees at the interim and transitional sites, and we work together for seamless access to primary community and psychosocial support while we integrate the Syrian refugees into our health system. So some of the things that uh, um, we will focus on today is the coordination, so the uh, we integrate and coordinate health system activities, the communication um, aspects of it as well. 
Uh, and I do I will not be leaving out the health service delivery, but I would look for you to share your insights in these appro in these uh, areas as well. First and foremost, I want to congratulate each and every one of you out there for the amazing work that you are doing. Uh, and it's time to appreciate each and every one of us in the care we are making a difference. So go ahead and give yourself a pat on your back. We have a long journey to go in supporting the Syrian refugees, but it's time to celebrate because we have um, overcome some hurdles. We have lessons that we've learned, and we are, have passion to move forward to empower these families. It's very important for us as healthcare providers to take care of ourselves. Compassion, uh, fatigue could just creep along. So it's important for us to maintain our own health and well-being so that we can do the work to take care of others we serve. Reaching out if we need the help, recognizing it in our colleagues, and referring ourselves or advocating for the best possible work environment for ourselves. So as healthcare providers, we may be overwhelmed with the challenges of addressing the healthcare needs of refugees. Despite the good intentions and the increasing number of resources available, the demands are high and there is a risk that healthcare providers and others may experience compassion fatigue. This can be anticipated and addressed through optimizing the use of support resources offered by professional bodies and organizations, online and health, telehealth tools, formal and informal support groups, and linking with agencies or others uh, with expertise in addressing the mental health needs of our nurses and interdisciplinary team members. So as you see here on the screen, the person has Five, um, you know, things that we already know is uh, we have the physiological, the psychological aspects, the social, cultural, and the spiritual and developmental. So just like ourselves, um, we need to care for ourselves, and this is a way we will be able to care for the people we serve. So let's um, take a little uh, of a check-in with the type of uh, population we're serving. We know the common medical problems with our Syrian refugees are hypertension, diabetes, hearing and visual impairment. Uh, we also hear there's dental issues, trauma uh, significantly, and mental illness. Cultural considerations as well. Uh, we need to provide cultural appropriate health care. Understanding the family dynamics is a challenge for us. Religious beliefs, food, and dietary restrictions are some things we've got to consider. Although the uh, Ontario Health um, Insurance Plan, uh, the refugees have been waived the three-month period, uh, some of them have also uh, received the interim federal health program benefits along with the Blue Cross for services. Um, it doesn't just stop there because we need to be very resourceful beyond the dollar to uh, extend our services for them as, as they continue to live in the place where they are currently, where we serve them, but also knowing that they are moving across cities, across Ontario, and also across Lynn and across different provinces of Ontario. So this is one uh, best practice guideline I want to highlight for you, is uh, embracing cultural diversity in healthcare. And this is about developing our cultural competence by our own self-awareness. So knowing how our feelings and behaviors towards our Syrian refugees affect our practice, reflecting and acting on the ways we are inclusive, uh, to be inclusive in aspects of our practice, and also identifying and seeking guidance, support, knowledge, and skills from role models who demonstrate cultural proficiency. The second item is also communication. 
knowing how we communicate and how it is received by our uh, Syrian refugees, as well as knowing uh, their um, uh, communication styles so that we can um, play an important role to in influence their health. And last but not the least, the new learning for cultural competence. So for our own purposes to uh, know about their culture as well as how it impacts their health. Person and family centered care is uh, another best practice guideline where we empower the person sharing options um, in, uh, so that people can make their own decisions. We respect the person and uh, personalize their care. Uh, through this, we have uh, an assessment in involving the assessment. Uh, we include therapeutic relationships so that with the person uh, using verbal and nonverbal communication strategies to build a genuine, trusting, and respectful partnership so that we can empower uh, and build this partnership with the, uh, the individual which is meaningful and they're engaged in their care. We need to listen and seek insight into the whole person to gain an understanding of the meaning of health to the person, to learn their preferences for care. And documentation is always so important for us, especially as nurses, uh, because this is going to be transferred along with their care to other areas or across the sectors. And sometimes this is a very painful experience that they may have shared and may not share that at a second time, but which will help in planning their care. Planning along with the family and the individual. So with person family centered care, the terms uh, that's used for person actually involves the individual as well as the family. And the term family is not only the blood relations, but it also includes any individual that the person would consider um, involved in his care. And each individual may have a different extent of being involved in the care, depending on uh, what the individual uh, is seeking. So moving on to the difficult situations that our Syrian refugees have just uh, um, left behind, uh, we, it continues as an unexpected event in their life. So from our best practice guideline on supporting and strengthening families through expected and unexpected life events, we must keep in mind the five R's that you see up on the screen. And I just want you to know that um, Josephine will be sending out uh, this as a handout following this presentation. So just in case some of you are looking at uh, writing notes, you will be receiving this presentation. The nurse family partnership is key. This is, uh, as you see from this um, uh, picture here on the screen, the five R's are actually grounding uh, the individual. And the other aspects on the petals, which is assessing the family need, sustain a caring environment, education and providing information, as well as identifying resources to provide support, are all uh, very important for the care of the whole individual and the family. So with this, I um, just want to um, bring up one instance of uh, an experience with a 10-year-old young girl uh, who had lost her best friend while fleeing to Jordan and was extremely disturbed about it. She could not make friends. She was afraid of losing them. This was how she coped over the last two years. So this is an example of 
the total pain she is experiencing, uh, along with social pain, which is uh, preventing her from moving forward in, um, you know, although she's here in Canada. So looking at this individual, 10-year-old, entering middle school with the limitation of making friends, how is this going to impact her? How are we going to play a role in helping her to settle here in Canada? So assessing and managing pain is a best practice guideline. It's also very important um, of uh, how uh, individuals communicate with us about their pain and what tools we use. And excuse the typo there for the cognitive impairment, uh, because communication barriers could be language barriers um, because of um, differences in language um, or understanding. Could also be related to aphasia, visual and hearing and cognitive impairments that could have significant uh, uh, in, uh, inadequate assessment because of the different tools we may not be using or we may not have a proper tool to use. So as healthcare providers, we need to make sure that we provide the um, use the right tool for this uh, for the right client. Uh, Shaila, are you still there? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, great. So managing pain can also be affected through um, a different, um, a, for a different age groups about how they're able to communicate. So again, using the right tools for that. You will find that in um, this best practice guideline. For our Syrian refugees, how have they managed pain in the past? Have they, um, what were the home remedies is important for us. If, if we um, know that um, and if, uh, they, uh, if we appreciate what they are doing in their own, um, as part of their own coping mechanism, uh, we will be able to move forward with that to um, be able to manage their pain appropriately, whether it be the physical, uh, social, psychosocial, or the total pain aspect. Care transitions, this is another best practice guideline which is very important because uh, this um, helps us as our, res uh, our uh, refugees move from sector to sector across the province or across Canada. And it's uh, an, a fairly recent uh, best practice guideline that has come out that is uh, for all health sectors. The focus is on coordination of care as well as effective communication across interdisciplinary teams. So as we move along, let's address the access to care. So for this, um, I, I just um, want to speak to an experience where I have been uh, working with a team um, of healthcare professionals as well as administrative um, service staff. And um, uh, part of my team managed a call center, a communicable diseases call center. What we realized was that uh, the first tier was staffed by admin staff, and the second tier was also staffed by admin. The third tier was nursing staff. And the calls came in to tier one. However, uh, those who had a language barrier uh, were, um, you know, either they hung up, there was a lot, a lot of dropped calls at this level. The second tier sometimes received calls where uh, language uh, was an issue um, uh, and they may have been able to serve there. So um, the third tier didn't realize, who were nurses, did not realize 
the lack of service that was being offered in the community. Until so together as a team, we figured this out, looking at the business, uh, uh, st uh, business anal um, analysis of the calls that came along the call center. And my purpose for um, sharing this information with you is because as nurses, we need to work together with our uh, um, interdisciplinary team members as well to make things um, work in favor of our Syrian refugees. So with this scenario here, we then um, provided uh, education to the Tier 1 and created a system along with our telecommunication and IT department so that if um, they offer, you know, do you speak Arabic, do you, uh, do you speak French, do you speak um, which are the languages, then those calls were given first priority to be put through to Tier 2. Because the person who is uh, having a language barrier uh, is not able to wait for five minutes or recognize that the um, messages on the uh, call while they're waiting are actually informational because those were in English. So as a result of that, we found more calls were coming up to Tier 2 and could be addressed because these were about the health of their family or their children. And they were addressed appropriately. Uh, we had also arranged for it, um, language services so we could call in an interpreter on the other line and communicate that. Um, a result of that was excellent outcome and uh, we had a high um, uh, a rate of um, um, uh, uh, positive health outcomes in this area. And very few of them then went to the nurses who still, should they have needed uh, interpretation services, that was provided to them again through the language line services. So this again, in a nutshell, is some of the things that are, may not be as clinically involved, however, involve the business processes, and we're the ones to inform that so that they are uh, the Syrian refugees are able to receive this service. <clears throat> so the interpretation services, if we notice here, the uh, scale is tipping a bit towards the uh, need for interpretation services. So the need is high. Um, there's more um, services required. However, the utilization is uh, lower. That means, you know, it's not um, as significant. And it could be because um, our staff or our team members need to be trained to how to utilize these services appropriately. Uh, and uh, only after digging into this or uh, uncovering a few uh, surprises will we be able to uh, frame a better service for our refugees. So moving along to the immunization uh, requirements, the children and adolescents attending uh, primary or secondary school are to be immunized against uh, diphtheria, tetanus, polio, measles, mumps, rubella, and also since 2014-15, uh, on entry to school, they need to have meningococcal protection against meningococcal disease, pertussis, and varicella chickenpox. So these are our Ontario requirements. Now these are some of the resources should you be looking for uh, Arabic um, or other Syrian languages um, uh, that may be required. Uh, you may be able to access some of the information sheets here. Just want you to be aware that uh, Sorry. Just want you to be aware that the um, Syrian uh, immunization schedule is different from the Ontario immunization schedule. So you will find that there are discrepancies. 
And that's important then if you're working with families to prepare those children for school uh, so that they're not um, stuck with uh, uh, incomplete immunization records, even though they have gone through um, meetings with several healthcare providers. So um, uh, I challenge you to take it on yourself to learn about what are the requirements for school and you will find them on, um, on the websites as well of the public health units you're in. Um, I just wanted to make you aware also um, that in Ontario, Manitoba, and New Brunswick, we have mandatory um, entry um, uh, school requirements for mandatory vaccinations. Uh, however, the immunization schedules across provinces may also differ. And this could be a challenge when our refugees move from one province to the other. So moving on to our Syrian food um, and dietary restrictions. This is important to know because of, uh, uh, you know, when we're helping them with nutrition planning or education, uh, we see that this seems to be a bit of an uh, area for uh, um, work here where uh, diet seems to be a, a bit of a problem with um, malnutrition in the children especially uh, that have come. So a question for us is, are our food banks also equipped with these um, uh, food items? Uh, should they need to access them? Moving on to oral health, oral and dental care is uh, another um, area for uh, some work in, um, with our refugees. And um, the, to, uh, this month being oral health month, you may find some promotional clinics that you're already organizing. I want to alert you to um, a resource here, which is ltctoolkit.rnao.ca, which uh, coordinators like myself across Ontario have developed for the use of long-term care. However, these are also resources that are evidence-based and best practices that uh, any um, healthcare sector could access and use, and they are free of charge, um, and you could download and uh, use these. Oral health screening and dental assessments for children, adults, and seniors in dental services, I'm interested in hearing from you, uh, the work that you're doing out there in the next little while. And I'm also having, uh, uh, also um, sharing with you one from my own uh, um, work area, which is Waterloo Wellington Lynn. There's a quick reference sheet of resources of by the region for the resources that are within the region. So the reason for me putting this up, I'm sure there's a lot of health units that have this resource for their area. Uh, it's important for us sending, uh, for example, uh, if, uh, if we're aware of a Syrian family travel, um, moving from Toronto to Waterloo, uh, to pull something up and link them already before they make the move. Mental health is um, a huge issue here uh, at different age groups. And the two best practice guidelines are about crisis intervention and assessment and care of adults with risk for suicidal ideation and behavior. Uh, I also want to draw your attention to the RNAO Mental Health Addiction Initiative, which will assist you by en enhancing evidence-based care and services related to mental health and addictions across all sectors. And um, it's a, a very good resource, freely available on our website. Children's Mental Health Ontario also has a lot of resources and services that they offer, and um, as well as uh, um, a CAMH is, um, and your local uh, hospital as uh, and um, health services. Yeah. 
Moving along to the interventions for postpartum depression. So what's really important here is the screening uh, and um, assessing and then confirming that uh, if there are depressive symptoms. Using the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale is in English, and this is usually a tool that is for uh, um, uh, self-reporting. However, if in some of the cases where our Syrian refugees are, have language barriers, it might be a requirement that the health care provider facilitate the, uh, the checklist. It's a 10-item checklist. And also interpreting the scores differs and for multicultural population and for non-English speaking mothers. So I would draw your attention to this best practice guideline. It does have uh, an appendix in it um, that would uh, help you to understand how to interpret and score so that uh, you're not missing a key um, item. Uh, however, uh, do remember uh, just um, that your critical thinking is of key essence as well here, um, your intuition, your um, uh, skills and expertise in this area. So do involve um, the partners and the family here. However, be aware that um, families um, uh, within the Syrian culture may extend to um, aunts, uncles, um, you know, other uh, close family members, and mostly the decision makers are the oldest male in the family. So um, involving uh, partners and other family members may be based on the um, acceptance of that family dynamic. Collaborate and link for continuity. I think I've said enough of this as people move along. Delirium, depression, and dementia. Now, this is not only for the older adult. We recognize that uh, delirium sets in. Uh, sometimes it is a result of uh, a lack of nutrition, lack of hydration, and it could occur because of the uh, health status that you may have uh, uh, received this family in. And uh, just know that in this best practice guideline, there are screening tools for delirium. Uh, minor uh, infections or even urinary tract infections, respiratory infections could result in delirium that may be perceived or uh, looked at as um, another uh, kind of diagnosis. So in case of uh, the elderly in the family, although we notice that there's a small amount of uh, older adults in this family, um, I just want to draw your attention to this best practice guideline and you'll find some of the resources available at this link. Here once again, there are some e-learnings that you and your team members could use. I also want to draw your attention to the uh, one on preventing and addressing abuse and neglect of older adults. They're all electronic, uh, sorry, they're all e-learning modules that you uh, could do at, at your own pace. And this will help you then to uh, identify uh, early signs of abuse, uh, and it may not only be with the older adults, uh, as well as to uh, respond to it appropriately. So here's making a difference, uh, what it looks like when um, we provide the care uh, much needed for our Syrian refugees. And with the work we do, um, finally, um, we want to see this, and we will be. And here is a Syrian refugee family, actually, that Josephine just shared with me this photograph. Uh, who has, uh, you know, it uh, seems well integrated into the uh, community here and enjoying the snow. So with this, I uh, would like to finish my presentation and Tim, back over to you and uh, looking to hear about more information from the others.
Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Shyla. You gave uh, an excellent, very thorough uh, presentation. Um, lots, I think, for us to think about, lots to reflect on, and lots of, I think, really um, valuable and important tools and resources that can be used um, within practice. At this time, I would like to open things up to hear from you uh, for any questions or comments that you have, either in relation to the presentation that we've just been privileged to hear, or just generally if you have questions um, that you wanted to raise. Um, Josephine, are there any questions that have come through on the chat uh, box? Uh, not yet, but just a reminder to everyone in the bottom right of your WebEx interface, you can uh, submit any questions or comments um, and we can post them inside the webinar for everyone to see. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe on the line, if there are any questions from anyone. Are the lines all open, Josephine? Yes, they are. Yes, the oh. lines are open. I'd be interested to learn more about the uh, who's on the line and what your experience has been, either working with uh, Syrian refugees or refugees general. What are you experiencing? So we're, we're starting to see some submissions on in the webinar, and I can just post them here and read them on the telephone as well. Uh, one participant wants to know, how can we volunteer in Toronto? Mm -hmm. Great. I think that's a great question. Um, there are a number of agencies um, who uh, accept volunteers. Um, one of them that we are familiar with is Lifeline Syria. And we've had uh, some dialogue with them actually even before we launched this um, um, uh, webinar. So it might be a good start to connect with Lifeline Syria. And if you um, search, uh, or maybe if uh, Josephine, if you wouldn't mind um, uh, getting the website and uh, putting it up on the webinar screen so that way we can share with you the website for Lifeline Syria. But I, I, I bring that one up because really it is just one of, of many organizations. There are also many community groups who are interested in, um, in seeking volunteers. And so you may want to look uh, more locally within your uh, community, whether it be a service organization, a number of uh, faith-based groups as well are um, organizing uh, different efforts, and so that might be um, a venture to consider. So Josephine will have um, the link up in a, in a second. Or are you on, can they see that? Yep. Oh, fantastic. So uh, Josephine has um, launched on there the website. Um, Josephine, are there other questions that have come through? Yes. Okay. Okay. So another submission we received. Thanks, Shyla. You talked about resources, and one area is using CareDove or the Healthline to access local community resources in Ontario. Shyla, does that sound familiar? Um, yes, yeah, so so I just wanted to clarify here. Is this um, is this something you're mentioning because different um, uh, local health integration networks have different uh, um, databases? Is that what it is? Um, that's a good question. We're not sure. This is uh, a comment that came through on the chat box. So oh. whoever um, posed that question, if you could please follow up with us with some more context in terms of what you're asking. And in the meantime, uh, let's move on to the next question. The one participant um, says, I'm working at Sick Kids, but would love to get more into international nursing and want to start volunteering or working with Syrian refugees. Oh, fantastic. Well, um, we certainly appreciate your enthusiasm. And hopefully, um, the, our advice regarding the previous question and starting with Lifeline Syria might be a good um, chance to explore more opportunities to get involved. 
Um, RNAO is also very um, pleased to have an international nurses interest group. And uh, I would encourage the person who has uh, posted uh, that comment that if you're interested in international nursing, that you may want to connect with the International Nurses Interest Group. If you go on to RNAO's website, uh, Josephine, if you wouldn't mind bringing um, the INIG website up, um, you can learn more about uh, the interest group. And so Josephine right now is just going to bring up um, the interest group website. Um, the, the great thing about RNAO interest groups is that they do uh, connect a group of nurses who have a specific interest in uh, a particular area. And um, so it looks like the website uh, for um, the interest group is www.inig.ca. And that will bring you into the International Nursing Interest Group. Now, Josephine, can they see that? Yes. Great. So if you're on WebEx now, you'll be able to see the International Nursing Interest Group and definitely look into, uh, it looks like they're having a, uh, a meeting coming up on Saturday, May the 7th from 8 to 11. And that will be happening in conjunction with RNAO's annual general meeting, which I hope you're all able to, to attend. Okay. Let's uh, look at the next question, please. Uh, what are the most common mental health um, issues you have dealt with regarding uh, with Syrian refugees? Shyla, do you have any insight into that? Some of the mental health challenges. Um, I, I can uh, only speak from um, some conversations that I've had with Frontline, and uh, some of the mental health challenges are mostly related to the trauma that they've experienced. Uh, and, uh, you know, for which they um, need uh, additional services. So I, the details of this, um, I would open it up to the public health nurses who are out there. Uh, please do come forth and share your experiences. Shiloh, that certainly resonates with what we've heard from previous webinars as mm -hmm. well as in dialogue with other individuals within uh, the sector that uh, the issues related to post-traumatic stress disorder uh, mm -hmm. have surfaced in the group. Now, that's not to say that every Syrian refugee uh, suffers from PTSD, but uh, that has been observed and we've heard that. And we've also heard um, some challenges with uh, depression um, and anxiety as well. But again, uh, not to say that everyone, of course, suffers from depression or anxiety, but that that has uh, happened or surfaced within the group. Um, we've also, uh, some of the other, uh, aside from uh, mental health as being one very important aspect of uh, the health needs of Syrian refugees, we've also heard in previous webinars and in, in um, a consultation with other um, individuals that uh, access to dental care and dental health issues also seems to be uh, an issue that is popping up, as well as uh, issues related to uh, immunization and ensuring that um, the refugees have access to immunizations and they're updated and consistent with the Ontario schedule. And that is uh, especially important, well, it's important for everyone, but um, especially for those who are uh, going to be going to school in Ontario and ensuring that um, they have the required uh, immunization. Yeah. And uh, uh, we also- Tim, just to add to that, I, I wanted to uh, just bring up that, uh, you know, um, although immunization was provided in the countries that they came from, uh, some of them were not available, uh, and so there could be, a, you know, um, a incomplete schedules. Although they may have some, uh, they may not have others. And it doesn't stop there because adults also would need uh, immunization at this stage. Thank you, Shah. That's a great point. And then we also heard of uh, some you know, respiratory and gastrointestinal um, issues uh, with the respiratory. Um, um, we have heard of uh, strep. Um, again, uh, not everyone, but some have had uh, uh, some issues with strep. 
and also um, some GI um, illness as well. Um, so uh, the next question, Josephine. Sure. Um, this participant says, I'm working to organize health care for two Syrian refugees who have not arrived in a rural community two hours outside of Toronto. I would be interested in linking with others who are assisting outside of Toronto. We have all HCP in place, but would just like to connect with others on an ongoing basis. Would there be any others on the line interested? Well, that's a great uh, offer. And um, perhaps we could... Um, I'm wondering if we could, uh, well, I'm just trying to think with Josephine, what is the best way of facilitating contact? Um, so if you are interested, you could email me. Uh, my email address, I can, I can post that later on, and then I can make the connection with, um, between you and the participant who brought this forward. Yeah. Fantastic. I think for uh, something like this, it would be important to know which specific LIN, because there are LIN-based activities, so the local health integration networks, and they are operating in each LIN differently. Great. Thanks, Shaila. Um, so if, if those who are interested in sharing um, their contact information, if you would send it to Josephine, and know then that your information would be circulated with others who have expressed an interest in wanting to uh, develop a network. Great. Tim, at this time, I'm uh, just wondering if we do have uh, people on the line who can uh, throw some insight into um, uh, you know, how we can address the hearing and the visual uh, vision uh, deficit needs of the refugees, knowing that it is not covered entirely by the Ontario Health Insurance Plan. Um, I'm looking for um, views or uh, items that you can help um, provide information to us on visual and or hearing aspects to help our refugees. Hi, it's Leanne Cross from CNID. Wonderful, welcome Leanne. Hi, um, I just wanted to let you know that um, we provide supports and services for people who are living with vision loss. Um, so we can do rehabilitation that includes helping people to learn how to use their residual vision um, regain their activities of daily living and independent travel after experiencing vision loss. Um, your best source of information and in getting in touch with us is to go to our website at www.cnid.ca and that will, um, that will link you to a list of local offices um, and email you can use for general information as well as our 1-800 number. Oh, that is fantastic. Thank you. Um, Shyla, so another participant also um, brought forward that George Brown College has WAVE for hearing tests. Um, Thank, Thank you. Great. So I'm just seeing here that we have uh, three minutes uh, left, and I want to be very mindful. I know everyone is taking time off in their evenings to join us. Are there any, um, uh, we, we do have, I think, Josephine, some additional comments, and what we will do is we will follow up with those comments after the webinar. But I want to take an opportunity now just to see if does anyone have any closing remarks or anything that they were burning to bring up on the line that you'd like to do so? Okay. Well, um, if you do have follow-up questions, by all means, you can connect with us. Um, I'll ask that you connect with Josephine, um, jmo at rnao.ca, and then Josephine can work with myself, and we can uh, ensure that um, your questions get posed to the right person and you get the answers that you do need. Um, so again, on behalf of RNAO, it is my distinct pleasure, again, to thank you all for participating this evening. Uh, for those of you who've had um, the chance to participate in some of our past webinars, thank you again for that. These webinars are recorded and are archived online.
So if you want to participate or wanted to view previous webinars, they are available online. Uh, and, and this web webinar will also be available online um, if you have uh, friends or colleagues who wanted to participate but were unable to do so tonight. So thank you all. Thank you, uh, Josephine, for coordinating this evening. And, uh, and a special thank you to Shyla uh, for um, leading a great discussion uh, and uh, providing a great presentation. Thank you, Shyla, and I wish you all a, a very good night. Take care. Thank you, Tim. Bye-bye. Have a good evening, everyone.